I never met a Christian who planned to have a mediocre life. I've never known anyone who planned to build with wood, hay, and stubble. I've never known a Christian who meant to have nothing to show for his life. I've never met a Christian who planned to have a mediocre life, but I've met a lot of mediocre Christians. Author unknown. I wish I could take credit for that. That's good. <laughs> no matter how we plan or how we think or how we hope our, our Christian faith, our Christian life will go, life sometimes just gets in the way. We begin to see church as routine. Our life gets so busy that our devotion time is sporadic at best. And it leads to a mediocre Christian life. None of us plan for it, but sometimes it happens. I'm going to read for you a, a passage today that I've read a hundred times before, and it seems like we do this a lot when I preach, but this time it made sense to me, and this time it lined up for me, and this time it, it uh, became crystal clear to me, and it had never been that way before. So I hope it does the same for you because it, uh, even if it doesn't, identify with you where you're at. It's going to be good and powerful because it's God's word, but it is applicable to our lives. There is a story of a, an old Indian chief, and you may have heard the story before, but I think it applies this morning to where I'm going, so bear with me if you have, and if not, then you're in for a treat. This old Indian chief had come to a, a new relationship, a new faith in Jesus due to the efforts of an early American preacher. This early American preacher would go to this tribe and continue to teach and teach and teach until one day the chief had made a commitment to Jesus. And the preacher would go back often and ask the, the chief how he was doing and, and how things were going and instruct him and encourage him. And he goes back to the chief one day and he says, Chief, how's it going? I was going to do an Indian accent, and that was, that's not going to happen. The chief goes, I have within me two dogs, a big dog and a little dog, and they fight all the time. The preacher was taken aback for a minute, and he finally asks, which dog is winning? And the chief goes, the one I feed. We all have two dogs within us. Paul talks about it often. The war of the spirit and the flesh is the two dogs. And the one that wins is the one we feed. Thinking about it like that is, is a revelation in itself. And the Paul says, to who you yield your mem- yourself members, your members to is whose slaves you become. To the spirit, to life, to the flesh, to death and destruction. But we choose who we feed. We choose what dog gets the food. If you feed one and neglect the other, that one's going to become stronger. If you feed the spirit, it becomes stronger and the flesh becomes weaker. That is my goal this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 reads like this. Let's go this way. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ, Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us a very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
There's a lot there, a lot of words. It's interesting to me that, that Peter starts out, he says, Peter, a servant and an apostle. The King James says a, a bond servant or a blood servant. And it was interesting to me why, why Peter would start out with a servant rather than his, his title as apostle. And it says, Simon Peter, Simon, his given name and his, his name meaning pebble and Peter meaning rock and upon whose foundation I will build the church. It's interesting that he refers to himself as Simon Peter, servant and apostle. And he's identifying with his humanity, with his frailty, with his, even his own calling. But he's sure. Those of us who have been given such a great and precious faith as ours, we need to... It's, it's interesting. We can, we can come boldly before the throne, and we have confidence because of Jesus. But so many times I come confidently because of Mike. And I think that, that maybe I'm more than I'm supposed to. Or I think more highly of my, myself than I ought, as Paul said. But Peter identified here with his, with his frailty and his humanity. To those who have been given or those who have received a faith as precious as ours. Think back to your coming to the faith, coming to knowledge, coming to salvation through Jesus. Think back to that time. Do you know where you were? Do you know what you were going, doing? I mean, some of us have been in the faith so long that it's hard to think back. But think back to your beginning. How precious that faith was. How real, how powerful, how obviously for yourself, life-changing. Peter, a servant, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace to you in abundance. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. Every time you hear the word knowledge in this passage, and it's going to be many times, it's not a casual acquaintance, but an exact, thorough, complete, and total understanding. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That knowledge is a Exact, thorough, and complete and total understanding. In verse 3 it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Why isn't this preached every Sunday? Why isn't this the greatest sermon or the greatest passage that the Bible has ever known? His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. His power has given us everything we need. Why are we so mediocre? We don't set out to be mediocre. We, we know how precious our faith is, our humble beginning, and how real and how powerful it was. His divine power has given us everything we need. Amen. Amen. Let's go home. His divine power has given us everything we need. Amen. Have you heard this preached? Yeah. I, I haven't as often as I probably should. He has given us everything we need for godliness. Amen. Mind blown. Through his divine power and our knowledge of him. Try to wrap your head around this. He has called us by his own glory and goodness, or virtue. Through his glory and virtue, he has given us very great and precious promises. Through the very great and precious promises, we get to be partakers or participate in his divine nature. If we participate in his divine nature, we escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. When we escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires, we receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. Amen. It's all laid out right here in this passage. His divine power has given us everything we need. We get to be partakers of his divine nature. If we partake in His divine nature, we get to be overcomers. We become victorious. We get ushered into a great ushering into the kingdom of, of heaven. 
I, I again, I think it's like, whew, let's go home. This is, this is fabulous. This is great news. This is one of those sermons, like the pastor tells about the, uh, the preacher who goes to a new church and gives them a sermon, and they all are impressed and wild by it and stuff like that. And he comes back the following next Sunday and gives them the same sermon again. And they think a little odd, but they think maybe he's nervous or maybe he's new. And he comes back the third week and gives them the same sermon again. And finally they pull him aside and say, Pastor, what's going on? And he goes, well, I'll give you a new sermon when you guys get this one. This is that sermon. I pray this morning that you get it. I pray this morning that I get it. I wrote it, and I'm still overwhelmed by it. I didn't write it. God wrote it. But through his servants and his servants to my ears. When we escape the corruption caused by evil desires, we receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. He has given us everything we need for a godly life. So why so many struggling? Why so many mediocre? You know, God could have rescued us from hell without inviting us to be partakers of his divine nature. But he does invite us to be partakers of his divine nature. It speaks to his intimacy, his desire for a relationship with us. He could have saved us and not invited us to be partakers of his divine nature. But he says, I want more than that for you. So as you partake of my divine nature, you become children of mine, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus. I adopt you into the family. That's the intimacy and the desire that he has. And then we get to partake of his divine nature. And it's that power that gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. Other than choosing to hear it and obey it, it seems like the work is pretty much done. His power has given us everything we need. Why so many struggling? You know why? We're feeding the wrong dog. Where are we at? For this very reason, verse 5 says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge. Make every effort. I think that's where we fail. There is a succession or a bunch of stepping stones here that hopefully you'll see. And if you've ever taken notes or if you have a pen, I even have a pen for you if you need a pen. Take notes today because there's a succession here that has nothing to do with my brain or my wisdom or my understanding that is laid out in the Word of God. But if you get this succession, it seems like a very easy roadmap to follow. Anybody need a pen? Make every effort, the King James says, giving all diligence. Since we are partakers in His divine nature, we have been made spiritual sons and daughters. Growth, therefore, in the Christian life won't just happen. We are to give all diligence, make every effort to see to it that it happens. Make every effort to add on or to supplement the foundation of our faith. I know that we are an older congregation, but there's some younger people here. And in gaming terms, if there's any gamers or people who have even played games, there are things called power-ups. Peter's saying that we need to find and use our power-ups We need to collect all the power ups, life and health and strength and endurance. And those are actually laid out in this passage that if we find those and collect those and use those and, and stack those and build those upon our faith, everything we need for a godly life. Find your power ups. Okay, really quick, back to grace and peace. I need water. I am talking way too much. Slow down. Whew. There's so much here. I'm so glad I caught that. <laughs> Better. Okay, really quick. Back to grace and peace. These two precious gifts are ours in the knowledge of Him. However, not only grace and peace, but also all things that pertain to life and godliness belong to us through the knowledge of Him. Knowledge of Him. Maybe that's where we, we lack is in our knowledge of Him. We had that encounter and that relationship and that foundation of faith, and we had that coming to know Him 
and it was great and it was special and it was fabulous, but we stopped learning, we stopped reading, we stopped praying, we stopped growing because of our knowledge of him. We don't have that intimacy that he so desires and, and feels for us, but because of his divine power, we have all that we need. Grace and peace are ours in abundance. You think of grace, unmerited favor, is ours in abundance. There are so many ways and so many things and so easy to be at unrest or not at peace in our lives. Peace is ours in abundance. Pastor spoke last week or maybe a couple weeks ago about the, or maybe it was part of the lectionary that the uh, Jesus calming the wind and the waves and the storm. He was asleep in the front of the boat and the disciples were fearing for their lives and he was asleep and he, he speaks and calms the, the wind and the waves. And that's the peace that is ours in abundance. One, the peace that he had to be sleeping during the storm. And two, the peace that, that knowing that he is in control and that even the wind and the, the waves are subject to his command. It's our knowledge of him that brings that peace, that brings that grace in abundance to our lives. So number one, or step one, add to your faith goodness, or in King James Version, virtue. Webster defines this as a moral excellence or righteousness. Faith is our foundation. Our entire Christian existence is built upon our believing and putting our trust in an unseen Savior. So now we are instructed to add to our faith, add to that foundation, virtue, moral excellence. I think along these steps that we're going to see, it will be clear to us, to each of us individually, where we are falling short, where our, our misstep is, or where our lack of understanding is. And I pray that, that, that you have all these steps and that you have all these factors in place but you will be able to decide for yourself. And the beautiful thing about this sermon is there is no judgment. There's no me standing in authority saying, I have all this. You need to come up here where I am and, and be like me. And that's just not the case. You're smiling and laughing because you know. <laughs> I know, Pastor Mike. But there is a, a, a building plan here. Some of you are engineers. Some of you know that, that without a plan, anyway, you'll see it. It's going to all come together. We are to build upon our faith with moral excellence. So easy to preach, so hard to live. Moral excellence. I told you the, uh, I had a young man come to youth group and he was uh, hard looking and he wore tank tops and he was just a, a tougher looking kid. And I judged him immediately. I just judged him. I said, that guy's a thug. And he came and he kept coming and he kept coming and he sang and he participated and he, and he got involved. And he was the sweetest young man. And I thought, what reasoning would I have to, to prejudge, to look at someone's outward appearance and say, I, I know them. We think that having the moral excellence of Jesus in us gives us the right to stand in judgment. And it just doesn't. I'm terrified of the verse that says, to the degree you judge, you will be judged. I guess if I was that terrified, I wouldn't have prejudged that young man. So. But we, we have to build upon our faith with moral excellence. Loving unconditionally. I am so glad I'm on this side of the mic. Add to your faith virtue. We have already obtained such a precious faith and have been made partakers of his divine nature. And while this is all a very good starting point, it is just a beginning. We cannot rest here as if we are finished. We tend to pause or plateau in our lives, especially our Christian lives, and we think that we have, we have reached a, a milestone or a level, or if I've added to my, my faith virtue, I can, I can take it easy for a while. But there are so many steps and so many things to build and to add. We get too, too often to, to rest. I've asked you before jokingly, have you ever stopped to think and forget to start again? I think we do that a lot in our Christian faith. We stop or we rest or we plateau and we forget to press on or to push forward, to add on, to find our power-ups. It's important that we remember that good is the enemy of best. Good is the enemy of best. God has his best in mind for us. And I can settle for being a good Christian. I can settle for being a good husband. But shouldn't I strive to be the best Christian, the best husband, the best father, the best youth pastor, the best associate pastor, the best window tinter? Good is the enemy of best. And we, we so often settle for good in our lives. And that's part of our, our plateauing, our leveling off, settling for the good. Peter's prayed that grace and peace be multiplied to them and is now encouraging them to press forward to obtain more like Paul did in Philippians 3 verses 12 to 14. 
Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind, I press on for what is ahead. It's not reaching that plateau and leveling off and stopping. It's reaching for what is ahead. I press on. I strain. I strive. I struggle. I fight to press on. Add to your faith virtue. Add some moral excellence to your life. Virtue is being as bold and courageous as a lion. Don't let your hearts fail you in the evil day. But show yourselves valiant, standing up against all opposition and resisting every enemy. You guys know the passage, the armor of God? Take on the, put on the whole armor of God. And you know all the pieces. Do you know how many times it says stand in that passage? Having done all to stand, stand therefore, stand firm, stand strong, stand. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Somebody else said it too, I'm sure. But having done all to stand, stand therefore. Add to your faith virtue, moral excellence. Stand in it. Be strong and courageous. Do not fail. Do not fall. Do not plateau. Do not level off. But stand firm. Add to your faith virtue. And to your virtue, add knowledge. Add to your virtue. Add to your moral excellence, knowledge. Paul said in Philippians 3, I want to know Christ. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I want to know Christ. How do you get to know someone? You spend time with them. I spent 33 years with my wife. Maybe a little more than that because of our courtship time. But she knows me. She knows me well. She knows when I say something what I really mean. And you see, that's not always a positive. She knows my body language. She knows my expression. She knows my sound. She knows my smell. The good and the bad. <laughs> Hopefully more good. But she knows me intimately because we spend so much time together. So often we, Jesus, where were you? Or Jesus, why did you allow this to happen? And we don't really know him or what's going on or his plan. It's hard to accept. It is so hard to accept sometimes that his ways are not our ways. Wouldn't it be easier if God just had his ways be the same as my ways? <laughs> no, it would not. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His plans are not our plans. His timing is definitely not our timing. But we get to know him. And the more we know him, we get to know his plan, his thoughts, his ways, his smell, his, his closeness, the small, sweet sound of his voice, the warmth of his embrace. We get to know him. Add to your moral excellence knowledge. Get to know him. We get to know him by spending time with him. We spend time with him in his word. We spend time with him in prayer. We spend time and get to know him. We have knowledge of him through the church and the community of God's people. Knowledge that comes from experiences and a relationship. A relationship we have with Jesus. A relationship that he desires. If his divine power has given everything I need for a life of godliness... I should desire so much relationship with him. I should desire so much spending time with him. Everything I need is in him and in his power. And I, I, I can't make time for devotion. I can't make time for prayer. I can't, my life is too busy. I just have so much going on. No one plans to be mediocre. Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. He desires to spend time with us. If we take advantage of that time, we get knowledge. All this in this promises of this passage, it says through the knowledge of him through our knowledge of him. So add to your moral excellence knowledge an exact, complete, and thorough understanding, a genuine knowledge, a knowledge that comes from our experiences and time spent with him. Add to faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. Add to knowledge self-control. Hardest sermon I've ever preached was a sermon on self-control because it applied so much to me. Self-control, self-discipline. Self-discipline. I, this one is unpleasant. The Bible even says so. For me to discipline myself, please, that ain't happening. The Greek word for self-control translates to one who holds himself in, and it's more than just a holding himself in so his shirt doesn't get all stretched out. It's one who holds himself in check, in place, intact, in control, self-governing, discipline, the ability to control one's life. 
If you allow it, life will spiral out of control. There is so much going on with family and friends and money and cars and jobs and, and careers and, and weather and landscaping and, and mortgages. And there's just so much going on. If we allow it to, it'll just spin out of control. Self-control. Controlling yourself. Controlling yourself and, and causing yourself to spend time in devotion, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in the community of God's people, gaining that knowledge of Him. We acquire self-control through the exercise of discernment. The ability we have to differentiate between good and evil, between right and wrong. If you obtain such an intimate knowledge and possess the ability to identify evil, you can then by reason avoid it. Self-control then is in fact evil avoidance. The ability to see temptation and evil and thereby avoid it. That is self-control. Discerning right and wrong. Discerning good and evil and thereby avoiding it. That discerning comes through knowledge. Knowledge built on moral excellence. Moral excellence built on a foundation of faith. I don't think I've been counting them off, but step number four is add to your self-control patience. Patience is better translated endurance. It includes the idea of steadfast resistance of all evils and the ability to bear up under life's difficulties. Those life difficulties I just listed All those things that can spin out of control if we allow them. Steadfast resistance. Self-control leads to and is then perfects patient endurance in our lives. We've all heard the story or the the saying that life is a marathon, not a sprint. Paul talks often about runners and and races and then people running. He says, put off the weight and the sins and those things that so easily entangle us, those things that slow us down, those things that ensnare us. Put off those weights and run. Patient endurance with steadfast resistance, but run. Run for the goal. Run for the prize. Paul says, press on. Forgetting what is behind. Forgetting other races. Forgetting other obstacles. Forgetting what you've already done. Press on towards the goal. Continue to run for the prize with patient endurance. Paul says, I want to finish my race. Add to your self-control, your avoidance of evil, patience. If we think of, of, of self-control as evil avoidance, and we add to that patience. You, you can't have evil avoidance without patience. Do you see the, the building blocks or the building process going on here? Add to this, this, add to this, this, add to this, this. It all leads somewhere. Add to self-control, patience. To patience, we must add godliness. <laughs> We're not even close to through. <laughs> To patience, we must add godliness. Patient endurance will lead to godliness. If you don't think that patient endurance leads to godliness, think of your life, your propensity to sin or to fall or to fail, and how patient our God is with us. His godliness is certainly because of his patience for us, for me. Patient endurance will lead to godliness. When God's children endure and handle life's afflictions patiently, we can gain an experiential knowledge of the loving kindness of our Savior. When we handle life's afflictions patiently, we gain an experiential knowledge of the loving kindness of our Savior, and we want to be like that. In Him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He dwells in us, so in us dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Godliness is in us. It is within us, within our grasp, within our reach, within our power, within our ability. Why so mediocre? I desire to be godlike. It should be the motive for which all our actions originate. To be godlike. What would Jesus do? Our, our motivation for our actions. To be godlike. To live like Jesus. To patience, we must add godliness. Paul says, you know when I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child, I did childish things. When I became a man, I put away childish things. This is mature faith. Let's put away childish things. Let's be godlike. Let's be like Jesus. To your godliness, add brotherly kindness. Loving God's people. The Greek word Philadelphia, we all know, love of the brethren. This is also a byproduct of mature faith. The judgment or the the bickering or the complaining. The ability to put all that aside and say, as Jesus so loved you enough to lay his life down for you, I love you. Don't ask me to lay my life down for you. The love of the brethren. Add to your godliness, brotherly kindness. We don't all have to get along perfectly, but we have to love each other greatly. 
First John 5, 1 says in the New Living Translation, it reads like this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is a Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. Love God's children too. For we are all God's children and experience God's love to our godliness and brotherly kindness. And finally, to our brotherly kindness, step number seven, add love. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with the compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, amen. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love for God's people. Love of God expressed in our lives. Overall, above all, and most importantly, put on love. In addition to all these things, put on love. Verse 8, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ineffective and unproductive. If we have all these qualities, it means that we are effective and productive. I want to be effective and productive. If you have these in increasing measure, if you build upon your faith and if you build upon knowledge and loving kindness and goodness, if you build all these things, if you have that increasing measure, you will be effective and productive. We have received a precious faith. Grace and peace are ours in abundance. Through his divine power, we have everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness, and because of these, his glory and goodness, we have very great and precious promises. It brings us to his divine nature, escaping the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Faith, goodness or virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, or brotherly kindness and love. All this keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. So be effective. Be productive. Verse 9 says, Whoever does not have these is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that their sins have been cleansed, their past sins are forgiven, have been cleansed. I'm guilty of verse 9. Because it's so easy for us to, to remind God of our sins, to remind God of our unloveliness. We even remind each other. I'm weak. I'm a, it's just the way I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And we, we continue to remind God how unlovely we are. And he says, I know. When you were at your worst, Christ died for you. Yes. I know how bad you can be. I know how bad you are. And that's nothing compared to my divine nature. That's nothing compared to my ultimate power. That's nothing compared to my authority in your life. Quit reminding me. As far as the east is from the west, our sins are removed from us. He casts them in the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. Why do we keep remembering them? So we can remind him how unlovely we are. And he says, I'm crazy about you. I am mad about you. I am so crazy, stupid in love with you. And stupid not meaning ignorant. Stupid meaning it makes no sense. That's why above all else we take love. We do these things. He says he ushers us greatly into the kingdom. It's such a great welcome into the eternal kingdom. Lives that we've touched. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the cloud of witnesses. And I, the, the celebration, well done, good and faithful servant, and the celebration that goes on. Again, we cast our crowns down. We're not deserving and worthy of any praise, but there's a celebration. When we do these things and we get ushered into the kingdom of heaven... That's the finish line. That's the goal. That's the prize. That's what we strive for. That's what we fight, claw, strain, and work for. That's why we build upon our faith all these things. Be even more diligent. Make every effort. Work hard. Do these things. Use your power-ups. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. If you do these things, you will never stumble. The Word of God says it. If you do these things, you will never stumble. Why do we stumble? We're not doing these things. And we receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. Here it is. Here's the kicker. Here's here's my conclusion. 
God loves you enough to accept you just as you are. But he loves you too much to leave you there. Yeah.